Now this is a very short video on the making a diagnosis of a tubular adenoma in the colon. And I'm making this primarily with my first year residents in mind. So when I look at tubular adenomas, I often look at them on low power. And what I'm looking for is very blue looking epithelium. And I'm looking for blue looking epithelium on the top. I'm also looking for these contrasts, when I'm gonna, which is something I'm gonna talk about over and over again. I'm looking for a crypt that looks atypical was where right adjacent to which there is a crypt that looks not atypical at all, looks like a normal colonic trip. And those are the two features that on low power I use to make a diagnosis of a tubular adenoma. And then I go on high power. So what am I looking for on high power to make a diagnosis of a tubular adenoma? I'm looking for cells that are tall, they're dark, that means they're hypochromatic, and they are stratified or pseudostratified. So multiple layers of cells. Here's one, here's two, here's three. So relatively simple, right? So here, here, and here, the cells look tall, dark, and hypochromatic. But you have to ask yourself, tall, dark, and hypochromatic compared to who? And the answer to that question is tall, dark, and hypochromatic compared to adjacent normal colonic crypts. And I promise you, you will see normal colonic crypts. So let's look at this focus right here. Here's a relatively normal looking crypt. There are the goblet cells. True, there are goblet cells within the adenoma. And in fact, adenomas can show panet cells and goblet cells and all sorts of lineages that you normally see in the colon. But look at that cell. That cell is at the base and there's abundant apical cytoplasm. That cell is way larger than that cell. It's way darker than that cell. And instead of having a single layer of cells, they are, at least on this side of things, they are multiple layers of cells. So tall, that's pencil shape versus small cuboidal, dark hypochromatic relative to these cells, and stratified relative to these cells. And that constitutes an adenoma. Now there are other features that do help, and that is increased apoptotic activity, and you will see apo increased apoptotic activities in an adenoma. I almost think of an adenoma as it grows fast. In fact, if you do a key 67, you'll see a lot of key 67, but it dies just as quickly. And hence, many of them, I assume, are eliminated over time. Very few adenomas actually progress to cancer. And so here's the apoptotic activity. In subtle situations where the atypia is very subtle, I will use apoptotic activity to support my diagnosis, to buttress my diagnosis of an adenoma. And there's one additional feature that I use to make a diagnosis of an adenoma. And this is something that I like to see anytime I make a diagnosis of dysplasia or an adenoma in the colon. And that is extension into the surface. So here it is, it's extending to the surface epithelium right here. Now, I do that for a very specific reason, and that is reactive processes anywhere in the tubular gut can get rev up the epithelium and the epithelium can look like an adenoma, but, but that revved up appearance is typically at the base. In a reactive process, you will not see atypia extending all the way to the surface. So yes, tall, dark, and stratified, but it should also be on the surface. Another feature, particularly when you're dealing with very subtle adenomas that is helpful, is this abrupt transformation. So here's the adenoma, and I can draw a line between where the adenoma stops and the normal epithelium begins, and that line is right here. And so that abrupt transition is a very good feature of both dysplasia in general, as well as an adenoma anywhere in the GI tract. I hope you find this useful. So this is the most common polyp in, a co in the colon, a hyperplastic polyp. And even the humble hyperplastic polyp can occasionally pose a question. So let's go over the classic histologic features of a hyperplastic polyp and then address the specific question that is being posed by this polyp. So let's start here. This is a very typical hyperplastic polyp. The first thing you'll notice is the incredible star-shaped profiles. The serrated profiles is something that you do want to see to make a diagnosis of a hyperplastic polyp. What do I mean by star-shaped profile? That's exactly what I mean. Doesn't that look a little like a star? And of course, depending on how the polyp is cut, you'll see these sawtooth-like profiles. Here's a sawtooth-like profile. Here's another one. Here's another one. And that is what is meant by a serrated profile. 
Often the epithelium, particularly on the top, shows this very hypermucinous appearance. The cells are filled with these microvesicular vacuoles. This is the so-called microvesicular type of hyperplastic polyp. And these cells are thrown up in little tufts, what I sometimes refer to as that very frilly edge to a hyperplastic polyp. And that's another very characteristic feature. Another feature that perhaps is not as well represented here is often on the left side, the hyperplastic polyp is associated with a thickened basement membrane. Here the basement membrane looks slightly thickened but isn't quite as prominent as you typically see. The other issue I wanted to address is that if you look in the mid-crypt area and sometimes at the base of a hyperplastic polyp and you stare down at the epithelium like here, you might notice that the nuclei are somewhat hyperchromatic and somewhat larger than you would expect. This is not an adenoma because when you back out, you will quickly realize that this slight atypia that is seen here matures out on the surface. So hyperplastic polyps can occasionally acquire that bluish tinge that you see with a, with a tubular adenoma, but watch for that maturation on the surface. Hyperplastic polyps will mature into that hypermucinous frilly epithelium on the surface. Hyperplastic polyps can be can show a significant amount of inflammation in the lamina propria. This is not to be mistaken for colitis. And then there's the 800 pound gorilla in the room, isn't it? There is some dilatation, slight dilatation of some of these basal crypts. Remember, this was in the rectum and each of these polyps measured less than 0 0.5 centimeters. And then there is this. It appears as if some of these crypts have broken past this muscularis mucosae and are extending into the submucosa. A prolapse type change, but we'll come back to this in a second. Let's take a look at quickly at this fragment. This is a big lymphoid aggregate in the submucosa. The crypts look perfectly okay at the base. This certainly does not look like a sesalcerated polyp but it certainly has that frilly appearance that is somewhat cauterized on the surface. This is again a hyperplastic polyp. Notice how blue it looks down here as well with a lovely maturation on the surface. And finally to the most interesting fragment of them all. So that looks like a serrated polyp, right? And then there is this thing which appears to be in the submucosa but is also serrated. So let's take a closer look. So no question, there is hyperplastic changes on the surface, lovely serrations. There is the issue of slight dilatation at the base, and then there is the issue of prolapsed epithelium, prolapse into the submucosa. So two questions arise. Is this enough to call this a sesalcerated polyp? And two, is this just prolapse or is this invasive carcinoma? Well, I'll give you my two cents worth. When you have prolapse-like changes, particularly on the left side, you tend to see some dilatation in the basal regions of the crypts. In my book, this does not qualify for a sessile serrated polyp, but I bet my bottom dollar that there will not be a 100% agreement on this. Perhaps the easier part of this argument is, is, is this invasive carcinoma or is this prolapse? And if you look at this on higher power, the epithelium looks exactly like the epithelium on the surface. The architecture looks serrated. It's accompanied by lamina propria. So this is very clearly prolapse. So this is a hyperplastic polyp with prolapse type changes. So here's a goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyp and I emphasize this because it is so easy to dismiss this fragment as just normal colonic mucosa which is why I've chosen a very low power field to show you that this is normal mucosa and you can see that this once you compare it to the normal mucosa does catch your eye right so this does look different from the adjacent normal colonic mucosa.
And what is different is that the pits of the gastric crypts are far longer and there's a lot more goblet cells in there. This is a goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyp. So a couple of things to remember with goblet cell hyperplastic polyp. So it is so easy to dismiss this as nothing. In fact, you can see a few normal colonic crypts. Here's the polyp. These goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyps tend not to show the same degree of serration that a microvesicular variant of hyperplastic polyp will show. Does one have to subclassify these hyperplastic polyps? The answer is absolutely not. But conceptually, it's very useful to hold these subtypes at the back of your head simply because these various variants of hyperplastic polyps, as you can see here, look somewhat different. These goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyps, as you can see, do not show that overt serration that a microvesicular hypervariant of hyperplastic polyp will show. But you see that expansion or the lengthening of the, of the colonic crypts, some dilatation of the colonic crypts, an attempt perhaps at serration, but it is subtle. And the entire epithelium, instead of being lined by that microvesicular epithelium, is now lined by goblet cells. Another useful feature would have been the thickening of the basement membrane, which often is often seen in left-sided hyperplastic polyp. Unfortunately, it's very muted right here. Bottom line, this is a goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyp. Hi there. So I'm going to talk about sessile serrated lesions. We used to call them sessile serrated lesions slash polyp. The word is lesion, although I'd so much prefer the word adenoma. Again, this is for your first year trainee. When you look at sessile serrated lesions under very low power, they look essentially like hyperplastic polyp. None of that blueness that you typically see with an adenoma. Remember, they are typically on the right side and they tend to be larger than one centimeter, but you can see them on the left side and they can be smaller. If you were to make a diagnosis of a sessile serrated lesion based solely on size and location, you might as well drop pathology and become a gastroenterologist. That's my joke for the day. Right, so how do you make a diagnosis of a sessile serrated lesion? The first thing I will tell you is forget the top. The top is uh, will get you only so far as a serrated lesion. What's going on on the top will not help you distinguish between a sessile serrated lesion and a hyperplastic polyp. Both of those lesions will show serrations. Here's a beautiful example of serration. Notice these sawtooth-like profiles, and if you get a crypt cut in the appropriate plane, you'll see the star-shaped profile. So this is very typical. In both polyps, the lining epithelium is made up of this mucinous, almost foveolar-type epithelium, often with a microvesicular phenotype. There will be scattered goblet cells. But like I said, forget the top. Let's look at the base because to make a diagnosis of a sessile serrated lesion, you require the base. As Megan Craner would say, it's all about the base. It's all about the base. All right, so three things you're looking for at the base. The first is dilated crypts. Here's a narrow crypt. This is what a narrow crypt should look like. Dilatation of the crypts unequivocal dilatation of the crypts. Criteria number one. Criteria number two, serrations. Here you see them, serrations going all the way to the base. So that's criteria number two. Criteria number three is crypts that instead of working, going straight down, instead start deviating and running parallel to the muscularis mucosa. And now this crypt is trying to do that. Now when it happens in the most overt form, what you will see is boot-shaped crypts. So here's a boot. It's a very tiny boot. It's a fetal boot, but it's a boot nevertheless. So that abnormal growth pattern running parallel to the muscularis mucosa is a feature of a sessile serrated lesion. You often see branching like that of the crypts in a sessile serrated lesion, but that is not a criterion that is often used. 
The fourth feature that often people talk about is an abnormal proliferative zone somewhere in the mid-crypt region. I personally don't find that particularly helpful. So the next question is, how many abnormal crypts do you have to see? If you look at the most recent version of the WHO criteria, all you need is one abnormal crypt, but it's got to be obviously abnormal. Subtly abnormal crypts do not count. I invariably, I'm a lot more demanding. I require more than one. I'd like to see two or three crypts before I make a diagnosis of a sesalcerated lesion. But you will find people making a diagnosis on a single abnormal crypt, on a single abnormal feature. You need not see all three features. Just one of those features is sufficient. And again, you will not rely exclusively on location and size. You make the diagnosis under the microscope and location and size is icing on the cake that can help you and obviously tastes good. But there's one additional feature with regards to this polyp and here it is. SSA, 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 SSA and then all of a sudden the architecture seems to change. Now take a close look at this. What's changed? Perhaps these cells have got a little darker. They appear slightly more hypochromatic. But I think more importantly, and you'll have to forgive me for all of this cautery artifact, there is increased crowding of the glands. But those architectural changes, I will confess, are very subtle. I think what is more relevant, as far as I am concerned, is what's going on with the cytology of these cells. If you notice the cytology here and here, the cells have gotten, instead of being tall and columnar, have gotten more cuboidalized and acquired this prominent nucleoli. Again, I'm a great believer in comparing what you think is abnormal with what you think is less abnormal. So to me, this crypt looks serrated. This is sessile serrated lesion. This crypt looks different because the nuclei are enlarged they're hyperchromatic and they're big prominent nucleoli. In fact, there's a mitotic figure. So that comparison to me is very helpful in deciding that this epithelium is pretty atypical. Does that atypical epithelium go to the surface? It probably does. I know it's rather hard to see. But again, this is a serrated crypt with significantly more cyto cytologic atypia, cytologic atypia above and beyond what you would see with SSL serrated lesion. You can use immunohistochemistry to support your diagnosis and what you're looking for is loss of MLH1 or PMS2. And I apologize for this slide, it's somewhat fuzzy, but even on very low par, notice this is the fragment under consideration. You'll see the staining all the way here and that atypical area, there's complete loss of MLH1 and PMS2. But before I go there, and forgive me all for all this bub air, air bubbles, but before I go there, I think there are some subtleties with regards to interpreting MLH1 and PMS2 on a sesalcerated lesion. And that is, an then sesalcerated lesion without dysplasia, the base tends to be very strong. And if you go to the top, the intensity of the staining decreases. So do not mistake this loss of reactivity on the surface as loss of MLH1 and PMS2. So there is this maturation-like phenomenon. And here's that area under consideration. This, these were the atypical glands. Notice how these glands have acquired these smaller profiles. That's another feature of dysplasia. They've also gotten crowded together. They've acquired these smaller profiles and they have significant atypia. That's another cluster of abnormal glands. And what you can clearly see is intact, 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 and these atypical glands have lost MLH1 and PMS2. This specific stain is MLH1. So the MLH1 slash PMS2 can be extremely helpful in confirming dysplasia, but remember only about 50% of cases lose MLH1 or PMS2. That is 50% of cases of sesalcerated lesions with dysplasia lose MLH1 or PMS2. So the loss is helpful, but if it's intact, it does not help you one way or the other.
One final question, does one grade dysplasia in sessile serrated lesions? And the answer is no. I guess nothing, you know, there's nothing to stop you from grading dysplasia. The argument against dysplasia, grading dysplasia in a sessile serrated lesion is that there is so much inter-observer variability that it simply does not make clinical sense. And finally, there are actually two kinds of dysplasia. There's the adenomatous dysplasia and the serrated dysplasia. Does it matter clinically? No, it doesn't. So don't bother yourself. But if you must know, this is the serrated kind of dysplasia. The adenomatous type dysplasia looks like a tubular adenoma. So bottom line, this is a sessile serrated lesion with dysplasia with loss of MLH1. So this is the least common of the serrated polyps. I personally think it's the prettiest of these polyps. They're typically found in the distal portion of the colon, typically the rectum. And when you look at these on low power, most, but not all of them, the smaller ones obviously tend not to show it, most will show this exaggerated papillary appearance. So to me, that papillary appearance is very helpful on low power. The other feature that you'll notice is that the polyps tend to be rather pink. In fact, when I talk to my residents, I tell them to refer to this as the pink polyp of the colon, the two Ps. When you look at this on intermediate power, what you will see is an exaggerated serrated appearance. People refer to slit-like serrations, but I don't particularly find that very helpful. So regardless of where you go down, it has this very prolific papillary pattern and this extremely serrated appearance. So there's no question that there is serration throughout this polyp. So it hits you in the face. Now here's that very pink appearance. This is, these epithelial cells have that dense pink appearance, which is very different from what you see in an adenoma. Adenomas seldom have very much cytoplasm to begin with, and they seldom show this pink appearance. What about the nuclei? Now, they do look atypical. In fact, they do look dysplastic. They, in fact, they look tall and columnar relative to adjacent colonic crypts. But this is not overt dysplasia. So it's very subtle, low-grade dysplasia. What you're looking for is these tall, pencil-shaped cells. You will see some stratification. But perhaps the most characteristic feature of a traditional serrated adenoma, it is seen in other polyps, including tubular adenomas, but seldom to the degree that you see in a traditional cells traditional serrated adenoma, and the feature I'm talking about are ectopic crypts. So these are tiny crypts that explode out of that serrated crypt. So here's the overall serrated crypt, and here's a tiny crypt, here's another tiny crypt, here's another tiny crypt. So these tiny crypts that are outpouchings of that serrated pattern are very characteristic of a traditional serrated adenoma. And here are a few more. Here's an ectopic crypt. Here's an ectopic crypt. Here's an ectopic crypt. Here's an ectopic crypt. So regardless of where you see, you see these wonderful ectopic crypts. Again, notice this tall columnar epithelium, not overtly dysplastic, but subtly dysplastic, and that very pink appearance. So to reiterate, the features of a traditional serrated adenoma are these overtly papillary forms, overtly serrated architecture, that very pink cytoplasm, and the presence of a large number of ectopic crypts. Now remember with TSAs you can have more conventional forms of dysplasia or low-grade dysplasia and high-grade dysplasia developing in them. It does become a challenge when you have severe and widespread high-grade dysplasia. It is very hard to identify the underlying traditional serrated adenoma and distinguish it from a tubular villus adenoma.